Eight of our class on the cults and Islam. Tonight we're going to be studying Seventh Day Adventism. And interestingly, in this book entitled The Kingdom of the Cults, Walter Martin does not technically say that Seventh Day Adventism is a cult, but he includes them here in the appendix. And look at how many pages. <laughs> so I find it interesting that he says it's not a cult, but yet uh, he goes on for about 100 pages, a little more than 100 pages, ex ex trying to sometimes defend them and other times expose them with their false teaching. What I, I believe that Seventh-day Adventism is a cult. It's, it's probably not as dangerous, so to speak, or out there as the Mormons, as we've been looking at, or even Jehovah Witnesses, but it does have some very real cult-like tendencies, so I, I do categorize it as a cult, and um, others that I respect also do as well, so that's why we're studying this, and plus there are a lot of Seventh-day Adventists in our city, and the thing that's really tricky about them also, you know, let me... <laughs> what's, what's tricky about Seventh-day Adventists is when you meet them and they, they will not tell you who they are. Even their literature does not say Seventh-day Adventism on, Adventism on it. It has their publishing house. I think it's Christian Herald Publishing. But, and then if you even ask them, what church are you from? They'll say, oh, it doesn't matter. What matters is, the you know, we believe the Bible. So they kind of, they minimize that. And yeah, it. it Obviously, our faith in the Word of God is important, but everybody has, does have somewhere there, some place where they're coming from. And, and I don't think any one of us should be embarrassed about where we're coming from. But they're, they almost are because they know they've been labeled as a cult, and they, they try very hard to be accepted as a mainstream denomination, which they're not. So I just say that kind of in introduction to this. So we'll look a little bit at the, the history of it and then some of their doctrinal deviations okay so seventh-day Adventism we're on page 28 does everyone have these notes then okay so the background here if you look in your book on page 541 the man who started it really before it officially started was a Baptist and his name was William Miller and that's what the blank letter a William Miller and October 22nd, 1844, and he set that date as the final date of the Lord's return. And he used, and we're not going to look at the verses that he used, but of course he went to Daniel, and he looked at verses in Daniel, and if you want to look at more and study more in depth, you may, on page 542 are the verses Daniel 8, 14, and Daniel 9, 24 to 27 are the verses that he used. But of course, the Lord did not come. One thing we can say for sure is everyone who has ever predicted the coming of Jesus Christ has done so falsely. <laughs> because he hasn't come yet. And a lot of people have predicted that he's going to come back. Well, William Miller was in that group. So when Jesus did not come, they called that, at the top of page 541, what, what did they call that in the parentheses, in the quotes, in the quotes? They called it what? Uh, the Great Disappointment, right. So that goes in the blank there under letter A. So when he did not come, this became known as the Great Disappointment of 1844. Disillusioned. Miller did not follow through, now follow up on his new theories, and he left the movement, so he left it, but he kind of started it unwittingly with that false prophecy because there were then a group of people who were gathered around that idea. So after this happened, a man named Hiram Edson and 
O-R-L Crozier, and I'm reading now down on the top, bottom of page 541, the bottom paragraph there, a group headed by Hiram Edson in Western New York, proclaimed in the doctrine, the doctrine of the sanctuary as embracing a special or final ministry of Christ and the Holy of Holies in the heavenly sanctuary. Okay? So here's, here's what this is all about. Edson and Crozier then come along and pick up the broken pieces of Miller's false prophecy. And what they say is that, and if you look on page 543, I'm trying to follow through a little bit on your book here, and you can mark it, and it will help you when you get to this point in your reading. On page 543 at the top there, it says, Edson found the reason why the Millerites had been disappointed. You see where I'm reading that? They had expected Christ to come to earth to cleanse the sanctuary, but the sanctuary was not the earth. It was located in, in heaven. Instead of coming to earth, therefore, Christ had passed from one apartment of the sanctuary into the other apartment to perform a closing work now known as the investigative judgment. Okay, so now that's, this is very important in Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. So write this in your notes here, letter B. The sanctuary. So that's kind of the headline of this. The sanctuary is Hiram Edson and Crozier and the cornfield vision. They have a vision in a cornfield. And the, the vision is this. Edson received a great spiritual revelation in a cornfield that instead of Christ coming to earth, Christ had passed from one apartment of this sanctuary into the other apartment to perform the work of what? Now, I just had read that. What was it called at the top of page 543? Investigative judgment. And so that's what it speaks about then on that page of 543 there, of that vision in the cornfield and and that's actually at the bottom of page, actually bottom of page 542. In the great disappointment, they, they ran to avoid the mocking gazes and taunts of their neighbors. They, they cut him into a cornfield. And as they walked through the cornfield in silence and meditation, Edson stopped, became more deeply immersed in meditation, and then with upturned face. Do you see what I'm reading at the top, bottom of page 542? Indicative of a heartfelt prayer for spiritual light. He suddenly received a great spiritual revelation. Okay, so that, so in other words, instead of Jesus coming back to earth, he just went from one apart, compartment in heaven to, to another to do this thing called investigative judgment. So that's where they believe Jesus is now, doing investigative judgment. Now, the pro what's the problem with that? What's the problem with that? Show me in the Bible. <laughs> Show me in the Bible where that, that, that happens. And in fact, where is Jesus? In the, where does the Bible say he is right now? He is at the right hand of the Father. And it says this many different places in the, in the, in the Bible, and especially in the book of Hebrews. He's at the Father's right hand. And he's, what is he doing there? Doing investigative judgment? That's right. Yeah, he's praying for us. He's interceding for us. It says he ever liveth to make intercession for us. So that's what he's doing. So it's a very strange doctrine. I, I don't even fully understand what it all means. Honestly, we could read the words of what they explained, but I, I don't fully get it. But that's the idea. So, But it was based on a vision, not based on the Bible. That's cult-like. So letter C is the Sabbath. So I'm just kind of summarizing these, the background and saying they had a false prophecy of the return of Christ. They had a false vision of this sanctuary, this investigative, Jesus going into the sanctuary, doing investigative judgment. And now there's a third vision we're going to see here related to the Sabbath. 
So Joseph Bates, this is on page 544, if you want to mark that in your notes, in your book, in the middle of page 544, he issued a 48-page pamphlet entitled The Seventh-day Sabbath. Is that what goes in blood? No, the letter C is just the Sabbath. So he declared the Sabbath as a divine institution, and I'm, and I'm quoting this, the Sabbath as a divine institution ordained in Eden, prefigured in creation, buttressed at Mount Sinai. That's on page 544, right in the middle, if you want to mark that. He argued that the Sabbath was a divine institution ordained in Eden, prefigured in creation, buttressed on Mount Sinai. Now, this is where Seventh-day Adventists do get a lot of people to follow them is they say that God, of course, created the earth in six days, and then what? Rested the seventh. So that, that Sabbath day is part of the very fabric of the creation of earth. And then they, then they sh show a verse. If you look here at Exodus and chapter 31 and verse 16, Exodus chapter 31, verse 16, where it says in verse 15, six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. So that, that makes it you know so that makes it sound like that's never going to change. So it, again, they, they go to creation. The seventh day of, was a day of rest, and now the Sabbath is to be a perpetual covenant and never to be changed. It's perpetual, eternal. So that's how they get a lot of people. Okay. So the fourth headline here of their history. So we have the return of Christ. And who's the main person there? William Miller, the great disappointment. We have the sanctuary in the cornfield, Hiram Edson. Jesus went into the heavenly sanctuary. We have the Sabbath, uh, pamphlets written by Joseph Bates. And now we have letter D, the spirit of prophecy. This is on page 545. And if you look here at the indented section at the top of page 545, It says at the bottom of that, like maybe five or six lines from the bottom, it says this thought was similarly attested by Ellen G. White, who wrote, this seal is the Sabbath and described the most holy place in which was the ark containing the Ten Commandments with the, and what's the next three words there? The halo of light. The halo of light surrounding the fourth or the fourth commandment. Thus the Sabbath and the sanctuary became inseparably tied together. So this third group, he says, group joined with these other two to form the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and they emphasize the spirit of prophecy. So there you have these three strands of, of uh, Bates, Crozier, and now Ellen G. White coming together, and... Halo of light is the blank there under letter D. So you have letter D, the spirit of prophecy. You have that? The restoration of the spiritual gift of prophecy. Adventists teach. Mrs. White's writings are considered authoritative. And that the gift of prophecy has been restored to her. White wrote that a halo of light surrounding the fourth commandment in the ark of the, the heavenly sanctuary. Thus the Sabbath and the sanctuary become inseparably tied together. Okay, so what do you get from this so far? What's the what's the basis of their authority? It's what? It's like visions. One guy had a vision in the cornfield that Jesus, he, he, he didn't come to earth. He went to this heavenly sanctuary. And now LNG White, vision of a halo around the, the fourth commandment. And so it's, it, and, it's and of course, it, it all started with a false prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's their background. Okay, so letter E is the concealing of their denominational connection. I already made a point of that. 
At Venice, do not put their name on their literature. <coughs> and so we need to be aware of them. I've, I've seen them passing out tracts, and sometimes, in, like I say, you have to really corner them. Okay, so uh, any questions about that? Any questions or comments? That's what that was from me. I'm not sure if I understand the um, Exodus 31 16 about yeah. for a perpetual covenant. So then, why are they holding on to that again? A perpetual covenant? Yeah. For them, it's an eternal, something eternal, something that will not change. But and we'll we'll answer that. But I'm just kind of laying it out there. That's that's a verse that they use. We'll we'll answer that as well. We need to have a good answer to that. So so really, when we come to the Adventists, I think what's uh, very important for us as Christians, we have to understand what is our relationship to the Mosaic Law. And when I say the Mosaic Law, I'm not talking about just the priesthood and the sacrifices. I'm not dividing the law, as some do, between the moral commandments and uh, um, the, 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 other, the, the sacrificial commandments and the other aspects of legal commandments. I'm not dividing the law into anything. I'm saying the Mosaic Law as one law. What is our relationship to the Mosaic Law? That's a, actually an important question as Christians. So we have to answer that when we deal with uh, Seventh-day Adventism. That's probably the main thing. We'll, we'll hopefully look at that. What was Blank <laughs> The concealing of their denominational connection. Okay, so uh, some of their beliefs, the spirit of prophecy. One, official Adventist teachings declare, we do not regard the writings of Ellen G. White as an addition of to sacred canon of scripture. Although this may be the official position of the church for all practical purposes, they uphold their writings as the authoritative interpretation of scripture. They desire acceptance among other Bible believers and Protestantism in order to spread their error. So on the one hand, you know, officially they say she's not, her writings are not equal to let's say the Bible. So they, they don't want to elevate her that much, but I would say in all practical, for all practical purposes, they do. They do elevate her writings almost to the level of scripture in, in a practical way. Because no one would ever say anything she wrote was, was wrong or could be corrected. Number two, some day I've been as recognized Mrs. White as their chief theologian and the spirit of prophecy resting solely upon her. She's quoted extensively and exclusively in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary. So I find that somewhat alarming that a woman would be the only person in the church who would have the spirit of prophecy upon her. And I'm not saying that as someone who does not believe God can greatly use women in the ministry. But what does the scripture say as far as who should be the leaders and the speaking authorities of the church. <coughs> well, I have a few verses there for you. 1 Corinthians 14, 34, let your women keep silence in the churches. 1 Timothy chapter 2, let women learn in silence with all subjection. I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man. And then in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, God brings great chastisement against this particular church because they, they had a woman... Jezebel, and she's called Jezebel, probably that's not her real name, but probably a symbolic name of her character, a Jezebel-like character, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants. So I do believe it is problematic to have in your church one person with the spirit of prophecy, one and only, and that person a woman. I believe that is problematic, <laughs> biblically speaking, from a New Testament perspective, you know. And to say you have the spirit of prophecy, if you have that, then that does sound to me pretty much like that person is going to be 
an infallible speaker. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a spirit of prophecy and you make a mistake, then are you a prophet? Mm -hmm. If you're a prophet and, and you prophesy incorrectly one time, are you a prophet? No. no. A prophet has to be like one, there has to be 100% accuracy. If you claim that gift of a prophet of God, that you're, you are getting a direct revelation from God. That's my understanding really of that gifted office of a prophet that they were receiving. So they could speak. They didn't have to go to the Bible to speak the word of God. They could say, thus saith the Lord, as he told me this directly. And this is the word of God. So that that's what they're saying Ellen G. White had. And I do not believe that gift is active in the church today. Okay. Any comments or questions? Are they like the Mormons who have like different books that they no, no, they, they, the writings of Ellen G. White are very important, I think. What is her book, The Great Controversy? They pass it out. You ever get that book? They give it out free around. Sometimes they'll mail it to you in the, in the mail. Um, I've gotten it that way. So, no, they don't have other authoritative books like that. And they don't like that. Data, like the version 2.0, version 3.0. No, no. They use the Holy Bible? I believe they do. Yeah. I think they use the King James even. Yeah. From my understanding, I'm not absolutely sure whether they, they may use other translations of, of the scripture. I'm not sure. But how would they justify? I don't understand that. I mean, it's it's just so perverted. How do they justify these beliefs if you're using King mm -hmm. James, especially Bible? And just these verses alone, First Timothy, Second Corinthians, Revelation. I mean, it just it's just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Can I have one more question? Oh, sorry. You want one? Can I have one more question? Sure. Um, I'm just wondering. So, why would the author consider them a cult and not a cult at the same time? Well, you have to. You have to really uh, re read what he has to say because I don't I don't really agree with him, but I think, and I, I would actually agree with this that, and whereas if someone was in the Mormon Church, they could not be saved. A Jehovah's Witness believing that theology is so out there, they could not be saved. I'm not so sh sure that someone who is in the Seventh Day Adventism where they do believe that Christ died on the cross and, and was buried and rose again. Although there's some errors, you know, connected to all of that. And I'm not saying this blanket, but th there could possibly be people in the Seventh-day Adventist church that are saved in spite of the doctrines, some of these very deviant doctrines that they have. I also, and I'm not, I'm not an expert in the Seventh-day Adventism in the sense of, knowing all you know they're like any other group and they have different splinters and different sects within this whole organization and i know that there's some that are like much more legalistic and militant <laughs> on the sabbath question for example have you ever seen the track that if you are a sunday worshiper you will get the mark of the beast have you ever seen those tracks i mean so there are there are some seventh day adventists out there that are that legalistic that if you worship on Sunday, they will just write you off as you're going to get the mark of the beast. So, but I, I wouldn't say all Seventh Day Adventists believe that, and he, he he actually deals with that here. So, it's a little more borderline in that sense. So, I I do call it a borderline cult, but it is definitely dangerous, and and obviously it's not a biblical. It, it's nothing biblical about it. People need to come out of it. And get into a good church and get biblically baptized as well. If you leave that, it's not a, a church that you know does biblical baptism for sure. You know, it's a it's a cult in that sense. So what can we believe about salvation? Well, again, I think what what they believe in their classic teaching and then what they actually may believe are two different things, you know. But here's why I do say that it is a cult. One, because of the writings of Alan G. White have been elevated almost to a status of like revelation with because she has the spirit of prophecy. Two, 
the false prophecies and false visions related to the founding, the founding of it is very deviant to biblical Christianity. And um, three, they deny important doctrines in the Bible. They, they deny um, hell, for example. They believe in uh, the extinct, you know, the extinction that some, but somebody dies, they become uh, without Christ, they're extinct. They have, they believe in a soul sleep, which is also what Jehovah Witnesses believe in. So they believe that if you were to die today, you know, as a believer, your soul would sleep until Christ comes again. So they believe in soul sleep. So they have strange views on various things, and as well. They do strongly emphasize the law. And so what do they believe about salvation? They might say technically, kind of like Mormons. Remember, we read the Mormon statement. So they'll say, oh, we believe that salvation is by grace, you know? And then they'll mix other things into it. And Seventh-day Adventists do that same thing. So they'll say, you know, oh, we believe salvation is by grace, but then they mix the Sabbath command and dietary laws, like Seventh Day Adventism was very big on health and dietary, the Old Testament dietary laws. So they mix legalism and the law into their system, and so that's why it's it's very convoluted and dangerous. <clears throat> okay, so um, Let's look at letter B then, the Sabbath day. This is their second main error. They, they have the spirit of prophecy, letter B is the Sabbath day. So they believe that the Sabbath is Saturday, is the day of worship, ordained in Eden. We already mentioned that. And in their official statements, they deny Sabbath keeping as essential for salvation. They say we are saved by grace alone. Hence, our Sabbath observance is an expression of our love for our Creator and Redeemer. So... I mean, so again, that's what they write. In other words, they're saying that we're saved by grace, and then because we're saved by grace, we want to follow him in obedience, which is true. You know, I mean, we're saved by grace through faith unto good works. So that, that is the order. That's the progress. You can't say you're saved by grace through faith and then go out and steal, kill, lie, commit adultery. You know, we're, we're saved to, to live unto good works, but we're not saved by those good works. The good works are the fruit of our salvation in Christ by the Holy Spirit in us. So they're kind of saying that with the Sabbath command, but I really think that it becomes such an important piece to their doctrine that, like I say on the next page, their official statement betrays the practical results for many Adventists are confused concerning salvation, mixing grace with their works. Okay, so why is, if you were to meet an Adventist, what would you tell them in why are we not bound to keep the Sabbath day today? I think that's the main question here. What would you tell someone why you worship on Sunday? Why don't you worship on Saturday when God rested the seventh day when he created the world? Why don't you keep the Sabbath day when it says in Exodus 31, 16 that it's to be a perpetual covenant? Okay? Isn't in the New Testament it says there on the first day of the week? What did I say? Um, okay, so that, that Jesus rose again on the first day of the week. Well, that's a start. That's a start. That's true. Guess who? Get, and now here's another thing. Guess who Adventists say is responsible for Sunday worship? For all, all you Sunday worshipers, guess who you're following? That's. I'm sorry? Pagan. Well, yeah, pagan. pagan, the pagan Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> so that's letter A. They'll say that uh, Seventh-day Adventists in that blank under letter A in incorrectly teach the Roman <laughs> Catholic Church and Constantine changed the day of worship. But this is historically inaccurate. So why is the Sabbath day not binding upon us? The early church fathers followed on the heels of the apostles give overwhelming evidence of Sunday worship. Ignatius, just a martyr, wrote Sunday is the day in which we all hold our common assembly. But still, again, what the early church fathers did, that's not our, our authority. What's the Bible say? Well, I think we could definitely start with Acts chapter 20, verse 7. 
I'm going to skip around here. Actually, I'm going to go down to point two to, to start. Who can read Acts chapter 20, verse 7? So here's the question. Did the Roman Catholic Church change our day of worship from Saturday, the Sabbath, to Sunday? Or do we find the early church worshipped on Sunday or the first day of the week in the Bible? We want to find it in the Bible, don't we? Yes. Okay. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Micah, do you have that, please? And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to great bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and, the continue, and continued his speech until midnight. Okay. So now, what's interesting about this, too, is Paul was there for how many days? It says in the verse before that. How many days? Paul was in Troas. Five days. Yeah. Actually... All seven days. So they were there every day of the week. But what day of the week did they meet together to break bread? The first day of the week. Now, do you know what Adventists will say to that, though? When does the Sabbath begin? Sundown. On Friday. And it will go till? Sundown on Saturday. So what they would say is that this was actually that Saturday night. But in other words, after, after sundown, when the Sabbath was over on Saturday, so it would still be like what we would consider. This, I'm just telling you what they'll tell you, what they'll say. They'll say that this, the Sabbath was over and sundown on Saturday, and then the first day of the week actually began on sundown, what we would consider Saturday. You follow me? So they were saying that's when Paul was preaching. So it wasn't he was he wasn't preaching on what our, what we would say Sunday <coughs> evening. He was preaching on Saturday evening on on the first day of the week. But let's say let's say that's true. Let's say that's true. I wasn't there to know whether it was the evening of what we would consider Saturday or the evening of Sunday. Let's just say that's, that, that's true. It doesn't matter because in their calendar, they were worshiping on what day? In their calendar, what day were they worshiping? On the first day of the week. Their Sunday, if their Sunday started Saturday, or what we would say Saturday at sundown, that was the, when their new day started. They were still worshiping on the first day of the week. It doesn't really matter. Whether we call it Saturday or Sunday today, it was their first day of the week. And that's when they gathered together to do what specifically? To, to break bread, in, which is to have the communion service, the Lord's Supper. Yeah. Okay, so uh, point two, you can write this down. The early church worshipped on Sunday. So you should know these two scriptures... These are the two scriptures clearly that show the early church worshipped on Sunday. The other one is 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. These are two clear scriptures that we know the early church worshipped on Sunday. Did you have a question? Oh. I was thinking if you read King James Bible, there's in the Bible where Jesus said, I read the Dead Sabbath. Then like, he said what? Jesus said, you know. Oh yeah, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Yeah, and he said, he said, God did not make man for the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath for man. In other words, because we need to have rest. You know, we need to have rest. So, okay, so First Corinthians sixteen two. Who's got that? Joni, uh, read verse one and two, please. 1 Corinthians 16, 1, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of the nation, even so do ye. Verse 2, upon the first day of the week, that everyone is really by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gathering when it comes. Okay, so what's Paul talking about? <clears throat> what's, what, what's very significant and important now, on this point now, we're talking about how the early church worshipped on what day of the week? The first day. How does that show that the early churches, plural, worshipped on the first day of the week? How do we know that from that scripture right there? 
Okay, they're giving their offerings, and they do that when they what? What is it? He said that there be no Paul didn't want. Okay, so what's going on? Paul's collecting a special offering for the poor, famine stricken saints in <coughs> Jerusalem. That's what he's talking about. And he's going to come and collect that offering. And he's saying, give that offering on what day of the week? First day. The first day of the week. And he says, put it in the bank. That's basically what he says. When he says, lay it in store, don't spend that part. So that when I come, I'll be able to collect that offering and you won't have to have a special. And what's the word he uses there? Yeah. Gathering when I arrive there. So basically he's saying when you get together as your regular practice on that first day of the week, take that offering, lay it aside, and it'll be there when I arrive. Right? Does that make sense? But here's what's really important too about this passage. Paul didn't just tell one church to do it this way. Who else did he tell? Verse 1. He, that's right. He said, I gave this commandment to all the churches to do what because they were all doing what worshiping on what day the first day of the week all the churches that's clearly what he says i have given order to the churches of galatia so so do like them so these are two scriptures that clearly show the early church worship on sunday and why is that and Joni, you hit at it why why did the early church worship on sunday because jesus rose again on this first day and what did he do on that first day of the week when he rose again in john chapter 20 and verse 19. john what chapter 20 and verse 19. It says, oh, who's got that? John, John 20, 19. Who's got it? Uh, my day? Oh, go ahead. Edgar, go ahead. Yeah, Edgar. Yeah. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Okay, and generally, as you read that down, Jesus gave them a message. Peace I give to you, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. And he commissions them. He breathes on them. They receive the Holy Spirit. They worship him. You know, it was the first day of the week. He rose again. And so I believe that set the precedent for the early church to worship the risen Lord on the first day of the week. And that became the practice of the early church from that point on. Because Verse 26, it says eight days again after eight days. I think I think that would be the first day of the following week. The eighth day there. Pastor, yes. Uh, was the first church using the same calendar as we use today? I mean, yeah. Um, I'm not sure what calendar they used, you know, um, at this point. I'm not I'm not positive about that. So I cannot answer that. Okay. Last thing I want to do, and I'm skipping around a little bit here. So do you write in point two, and I want you to know those verses. And under point two there, on page 30, the early church worshiped on Sunday. Is that what you wrote? Okay, so that's what you should have written there. So the Catholic Church did not change the day of worship to Sunday. The early church worshiped on Sunday. Now I want us to, to go down to point four. And in Romans 6 through 8, Galatians 3 and 4, Here's biblical evidence, and to me, this is the strongest evidence of why we're not under the Mosaic Law. I ask, what is our relationship to the Mosaic Law? And I believe Paul deals with that in Romans 6, 7, and 8, also Galatians 3 and 4. And here's what you can write in that blank. We are dead with Christ, Delivered from the law, you're going to have more than you can write in that blank. So you have to write underneath it. Don't get mad at me. I didn't leave enough blanks there. We're dead with Christ 
delivered from the law, dead to the law, and under a higher law. Okay? So, in Romans 6, Paul says that we're in Christ, crucified with him. We're dead. Now, go just as we close, I'm going to hit this pretty fast, and we'll start here next week. But look at Romans 7. We could spend a whole hour on this, so I'm a little frustrated. We're going to spend like two minutes. But Paul's giving an illustration here, and basically he's saying if a woman is married to a man, but the man dies, she's free. And in his illustration, in verse 4, he says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. So in his illustration, he's talking about a woman who's married to a man and the man dies. We're the dead husband. We're the ones who die. When we come to Christ, we die. We're in Christ, dead with him. The old man is dead, crucified. So we're, we've died. The old man is dead. And so that's why he says in verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So where are you positionally? You are where? In Christ. Where's Christ? He's dead, but is he stay dead? No. No. But you're in him dead. You're in him buried. You're in him now where? Resurrected. Resurrected. Seated with him in the heavenly places. So you're in Christ spiritually. Now, when Jesus died. Now, okay, look at, let me ask you. When Jesus lived, was he under the law? Natasha, get this. When Jesus lived his earthly life, did he live it under the Mosaic law? Yes. Yeah. But when he died, was he under the law anymore? He wasn't under the law anymore when he died. You're in Christ. Dead. You're in Christ. Dead in Christ. Are you under the law? No. You're dead to the law. Like Christ died to the law. So that's the first argument right there. But then he says in verse 6, and now we are delivered from the law. Through Christ we have been delivered because we're in Christ, crucified, buried, and raised. And so we're delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. And then he says, what then? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No, I had not known sin, but by the law. So what law is he talking about? He tells us in the following part of that verse 7, he says, I had not known sin, but by the law. And he's saying, now he just said, I'm dead to the law and delivered from the law. Now, again, some people want to divide the law. They want to say we're, we're still under the moral Ten Commandments, but we're not under, you know, the, the ceremonial, and I'm, man, I'm getting a mental block. We're not under the ceremonial aspects, you know, the priesthood and the sacrifices, and we're not under all the ethical commands of the law. But we're, some want to divide the law into those parts. Are you with me? But Paul's just saying the law. And then he says, I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. What part of the law is that? That's, that's one of the big Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not covet. So get the context. The context is he says, I'm dead to the law. I'm delivered from the law. Does that include the Ten Commandments on this context? Yes. yes. Now, every one of those commandments is repeated in the New Testament, except the Sabbath command. And we're not under the strict commandment. In other words, I haven't kept the commandment if I don't kill you. The, the, the spirit of the command is I need to love you and that's the higher law we're now under Romans chapter 8 and verse number 2 he says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death so you see, I'm dead with Christ, I'm buried, I'm raised, and now I have the Holy Spirit under a higher law, the law of the Spirit. So really, Paul's progression in Romans 6, and we didn't go into Romans 6, we went right into Romans 7, but he clearly says 
in, in Romans 6, we're not under the law, but under grace. And then he explains it in Romans 7, we're dead to the law, delivered from the law, we're in Christ, and now we're under a higher law, the law of the Spirit has set me free from that law, the Mosaic law of sin and death. So that's why we're not under the Sabbath command. We're in Christ. Okay, so we'll stop right there. Pastor, I didn't get one, two.